it's just frustrating. And uh, so I'm getting mad. That's taking so long. When we get home, we realize that there was a bus accident, and actually people died. And when I realized that that's what was causing the backup, I felt so horrible. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what allows me to get to that point in my life where I'm so stressed out over something insignificant? You know, God's in control of all of it. There's a building, and it, it's going to leak. You know, the building's going to have its moaning and groaning. It's old. The tenants are going to complain. It's just life, but it's signs of life. So I praise him for that. But at the same time, it reminds me that um, my, I, I'm not seeing what's going on behind the scenes. And I have to be intentional to recognize that there's something going on behind the scenes. And so I prayed for the family. And I also prayed God that he would just change my heart to where I would react differently in situations like that and remember that I'm just a part of another story that's going on. And that kind of leads into the sermon because backstories are important. And sometimes when we don't know what's going on behind the scenes, we don't necessarily react the way that we should. Um, and we don't represent Jesus well because we don't take the time to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And I think some of us can relate to that, right? When you step into a conversation and uh, you you don't know what's going on, you don't know the tension, but you can feel it, the way people are talking to each other, and you wonder, wow, what's going on? Or when you, you, you sit down um, and, and you're at a table in a group of people and they're talking and it seems like uh, a husband and wife are really frustrated with each other and they're just uh, responding negatively to each other and you, you tend to think, wow, what's going on there? And the reality is that there's always something going on behind the scenes. And, and John's narrative is, is gripping in the way that he tells this story. Because he's brought us to a point where we left off last week. But now he's going back a little bit and giving us the backstory on what's going on behind the scenes. Because as we look at these things in Revelation, we think, wow, this is horrific. There's a lot of stuff that's going on. And we wonder, how could God be doing this? But the reality is we don't know the backstory. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And that's what our, our message is going to be looking at today in Revelation chapter 12. So as I switch mics, if you have your bulletin, go ahead and open it up. Pull out your outline. And a special welcome to any first-time visitors that we have or returning. If Cornerstone is not where you've called home and you don't belong to a church family, this blue hello card, if you would not mind turning it around, putting your information, just name and a contact, whether it's your email or cell phone, I'd love to reach out and connect and just hear what God's doing in your life. What brought you here? And maybe our roads are not meant just to be random bumps or crosses or parallel, but maybe they're meant to merge. And if that's God's will, I'd love to explore that with you. So again, this blue hello card, it's underneath the seat in front of you. Just go ahead and fill it out. You can leave it on your seat when you leave. Uh, when I clean up, I will stop, grab it, and reach out and connect to you. That said, let's continue our time of worship and jump into God's Word. Heavenly Father God, thank you so much. Father, we give you praise for your faithfulness in our lives. Thank you, Father, for being able to just hit pause and look and say, wow, what could have been in that situation? And, and, and praise you for what, how you preserved us, how you saved us, how you just worked circumstances that brought good into our moment in our life. But, Father, we also take the time to pray for those, Father, um, as we see tragedy touch in so many shapes and forms. Father, from school shootings to overturned buses to just uh, terroristic activity, Father, and, 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 and peace and, and promises being broken all over this world. Father, we're reminded that humanity in its best effort choosing anything other than Jesus Christ is a false summit, Father, and it will never bring truth because truth is only found in Jesus. So, Father, as we recognize that and as we celebrate that for our own lives, I pray that your spirit would grow our faith. So many times, your son said, to have faith. So many times in scripture, we are exhorted to have faith. And today, we are going to be challenged to invest in maturing our faith so that it can stand in a day to where you give the enemy opportunity to conquer over the saints. Father, may we have such faith and may this contribute to strengthening our faith in you, your sovereign grip. This is your story, Father. May we have faith and trust in your unchanging character. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name I plead. Amen. 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 Folks, I, Revelation is a love-hate relationship. Every time I sit down to, to finalize an outline, I get exceptionally frustrated um, with myself for choosing to, to preach for the book of Revelation. Um, <laughs> This sermon, <laughs> no exception. So again, this is backstory. 
I know if uh, any of you have seen the Lord of the Rings, um, I'm going to use a movie uh, reference because it, it just it flows so well. But if you've seen Lord of the Rings, you remember the Fellowship of the Ring. And shortly, uh, uh, well, about middle middle of it, Gandalf apparently dies, right? He gets pulled down by this giant flaming monster demon, and he plummets down. And the story continues with the, the Fellowship, the, the bearers of the ring, on, on their mission. But then in the Two Towers, the sequel, it picks up and kind of goes back in time to where you thought Gandalf died. But he really, you realize that there was a whole other story going on while the one that we watched happened. So while we saw Frodo and all the adventurers taking the ring, Gandalf was going through his own adventure that was parallel, and they would come back and meet at a moment in time to where we as viewers could understand the backstory. That's the way that a storyteller will capture details and present it in a way that doesn't overwhelm the reader with too much at once. Too much at once. Because most people have not read the books. So how do you tell a story that keeps people's attention? And I find that in Revelation, there's the, the way the Spirit led John to, to, to now step back from what we've been going through and give backstory on what's going on behind the scenes between God and Satan, sin and humanity, it eventually will merge again in the book of Revelation later on. But God wants us to understand that it's not all about us. It's not all about you, it's not all about me, and it's not all about the circumstances that are on our plate that feel like the entire world in this moment. That there is a backstory going on, warfare that is going on, spiritual warfare. And that's what we're going to look at today. So we begin in Revelation chapter 12. While John is, has just had this vision of Jesus coming down to receive his inheritance, and all the kumbayas coming together in a triumphant celebration, all of a sudden, which John probably thought was, this is it. The kingdom of God has come. All of a sudden, he hears this woman screaming in pain in heaven, screaming under the torment of giving birth. And he's pulled from this reality of celebration, of triumph, and he's brought into Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And he says, this great sign appeared into heaven just when John thought he had God figured out. He sees a woman that's clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was pregnant, and she was crying out in birth pangs at the agony of giving birth. No sedatives are indicated to be given to this woman. So imagine just being there, being, and if you've, you've ever been in the room when a woman has given birth, it's intense from a man's perspective. All honesty and humility, I passed out. When Hayden was being born, I literally passed out. My face was on the floor. I had damage and was bleeding my nose. True story. We'll give you the details later. But it's, it's intense on every level possible. I experienced things that, that just... I, I, I just give kudos to my wife. I, I, I think I knew strength. Holy smokes. No, no. Um, but the, 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 the pain, the pushing, the cheering on, the encouragement, but just, just the struggle of it. There's so much happening in what John is seeing. He's probably thinking to himself, I'm about to pass out. What's going on, Lord? And if that wasn't crazy enough, he looks and he sees another sign up here in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. Now Sage loves this because she loves dragons. And whenever we say, well, they're not necessarily the way that you understand them in fantasy, you come to Revelation, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Look, the Bible says. So here's this red dragon. And his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So understand this image, this woman who is, who is struggling to give birth. And there's every indication that she is alone. And this dragon who has swept a third of the stars to the earth is now seated there waiting to devour this child as soon as he's born. This mother would surely know that. This mother would know that. But there's nothing that she can do. When it's time to give birth, it does not matter where you are at. It does not matter what is going on or what you had on the schedule. 
all things stop because the baby is coming. The baby is coming. So this dragon is poised to devour this child. And then she gives birth to a male child. And this child is one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she was prepared, a place prepared by God, in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. So what in the world is going on and what is John seeing? Now again, I believe Revelation is all roads in Scripture that are rooted in the person and work of Jesus coming together in what we see in Revelation. So I'm not going to go into the fanciful delights of some expositions, but I simply want to look at how these images have been used in Scripture and how it applies to our decision to take a step closer to Jesus today. So this, this idea of a woman appearing in heaven, I want to look at God's promise to women. And I have this in your going deeper today. You don't need to turn, just listen. I'm going to Revelation chapter 3, or uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Then God said to the serpent, because you have done this, because you have brought the sin into the, the selection, the opportunity, the invitation to Eve and to Adam, because you have done this, you are cursed. I will, above all livestock, beasts of the field, on your belly you'll go, dust you will eat all the days of your life. Now listen to this. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now remember this dragon who is poised to devour this child. There evidently, you just don't wake up and want to consume a child. There's hatred. There's hatred between this dragon and this child. And this child. This dragon has swept a third of an angelic presence in an effort to destroy this child. So there's enmity. There's the strongest form of tension possible that's been prophesied here. And to the woman, he says, or first he says, your offspring, will his, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, here it is, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you will bring forth your child. Kind of like what John is seeing, right? He's seeing this woman giving birth in great pain, agony. Your desire will be contrary to your husband, and it, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is his ground because of you. In pain you shall eat it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plant of the field. By the sweat of your face... Uh, the, that light, strobe action, until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you will return. And the man called his wife Eve. Why? Because she was the mother of all living. Why is this important to what we're reading about in the book of Revelation? Because this promise that God gave to the first created in his image beings was fulfilled in what we're seeing in Revelation. Was fulfilled in what we're seeing in Revelation. The tension he promised between the serpent and the woman and the woman's child this offspring was declared by a sovereign God. It was allowed to take place by a sovereign God. And that's important that we understand that right from the beginning. Because understanding how evil is allowed to take place, how God can be in control, yet things happen like this, it's important that we understand that, that God's sovereignty is controlling the limit of evil. And what it can do. So this enmity, this dragon hating this child so much and standing there poised to consume was a lot of God. A lot of God. But why? But why? And I want to continue. This child that was promised, this child that was promised, why is he so hated? In the book of Hebrews chapter 2, the book of Hebrews chapter 2, listen, listen to these words. Why? Because listen to what the author says. Therefore we must pay close attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. See, Learning something and holding on with something as truth are two different things. We learn a lot of things. I pray that as a pastor, I'm not just filling your heads, but introducing you to something in Scripture that, that it so catches your attention that you want to pursue it throughout the week, that you want to go deeper with God, that you want to wrestle with the Holy Spirit. I pray that, especially today, if you don't walk out of here with questions and, and your understanding of Scripture is shaken up, something's wrong, and I fail. You should walk out of here with a lot of questions. And I pray that those questions lead you into Scripture. Because 
some of this that we're going to talk about disagrees with a lot of declarations that are on TV right now about where the world is going and the role that the church plays in ideas of the rapture. And so I want, really, to listen to what Scripture is saying. Why? Because Hebrew warns we can drift away from it. We can drift away from it. And that's not by accident. We're going to see that that's intentional. Intentional. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, God is holy, and, and sin has to be paid for. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember that verse, signs and wonders, signs and wonders who the Spirit distributes according to His will. What does that mean? What does that look like? Look around you, because we should see that in the church right now. Body of believers. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. For it was not to the angels. Now listen to this, because this is pivotal, verse 5. It was not to the angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, at present, we do not see everything subject to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, in case you haven't figured out who he's talking about. Jesus, who is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For what does he do? He sanctifies those who are sanctified. All have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren, brothers, family, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Understand what the, the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's giving us a vision like John had seen, where Jesus stands before the Father. Jesus, who was made lower than the angels to become salvation for God's children, for God's chosen. He has provided a way of redemption. And now he stands here with those the Father has given him and declares them his family. And they share, they share in the glory that is Jesus as part of the triune Godhead. So what was momentarily lower than the angels is now exalted above the angelic realm, the angelic realm. And what's interesting when we look at why does Satan hate God so much? Why is there such tension between him and the Father? Many understand this because the angels didn't understand it was a mystery what God was going to do through creation they got hints of it they saw degrees of it but the more that it became a reality through the unfolding of human history and the effort of prophets to speak truth of God's plan of redemption the idea that God would become lower than the angels and lift man to share in his glory and not afford that to those who felt deserving? I think we can relate to why he's so angry at God, right? If we think about it? Jonathan Edwards, one of my favorite um, Puritan writers, comments on this passage and says that this is by far the heart of, of where the hatred for God came and why he detests Jesus Christ. Because the idea that man, who and that's why he accused them before the Father so often and so much, really, you're going to love him? Really, you're going to lift her up to share in your glory? Did you not see what they did? That third of the realm that came down working in the world to prove why humanity doesn't deserve God's love? And you're going to raise them up? And he does that through his son. See, this is what Hebrews is talking about. This is Where does that enmity come from? It's the reality of what's in this passage. The reality that God loves us and redeems us, not anything else that he created. You and I have found undeserved favor with the Creator. All oh, things. You feel that. Do you know that? Then you know why you're hated. I say. He continues. For surely it was not the angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. 
Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. When Jesus became man, he became subject to the laws of, hum of, of nature, of the world that God created. He comes from the eternal into the creation of space and time. He becomes restrained with the restraints that humanity faces, yet without sin. He willingly put himself in that subjection to become our Redeemer. For because of himself, he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who have been tempted. So where Satan works to fuel our sinful nature and bring accusation to the Father of our unworthiness, Christ stands as a universal silencer to that because the Father doesn't see that. He sees his Son and you and me. And there's nothing that Satan can do to mar that image. But that's not our reality right now in the physical sense. That's not our reality right now. We suffer. We're touched by sin. And persecution has come, is present in parts of the world, and is going to become a reality for every believer in the world at some point in time. So, But we hold on to it. Because this is our faith. Do you believe that? Yeah. If you believe it, what are we doing with it? And that's where it continues. And that's what gets exciting when we come back to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. I'm doing fantastic on time. Yes, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I actually prayed that the sun would slow. I figured if he answers Joshua, why can't he answer to Damien? Um, so we have this, this, this woman, this vision that, that uh, this woman being clothed with sun, moon, and stars was similar to Joseph's dream that he had and why it's understood to be the representation of Israel. Israel leading up to fulfill the promise that God gave to Eve that a child would come and that would that would redeem humanity. And, and, and so Satan, this mighty dragon that we'll come to see is actually who this is, um, is working to stop that. And that's in your going deeper. But this woman gives birth. We know Jesus came. He saw. He conquered. He reigns. Right? Amen? And so this, this, this is a, the first defeat of this dragon. The first defeat of this dragon. He could not stop the Messiah from coming. So what does he do? What does he do? This woman is now fled. In verse 7, in verse 7, war breaks out in heaven. War breaks out in heaven. Now understand what this would be. Understand what has taken place here. Satan who has brought accusation before the throne of God, who stands here, the God who is seated, the angelic realm stands when they're in the presence of God or kneels. They don't sit. You don't sit unless you are the one with authority. And Christ is what? Standing or seated at the right hand of the Father? Seated. Because he has everything brought in subjection under him. So this, this fiend who stands before the throne of God, bringing accusation to us, cowers underneath the reality of the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ that has been given to him by the Father and has nothing which to bring accusation now against us before God. And when he sees this, and he sees the reality that God's humanity that's redeemed is going to share in this glory, literally hell breaks loose. He draws his sword in anger, and there's war that breaks out in heaven. And this war is responded by Michael and his archangels, and they drive Satan down to the earth. Jesus himself said, under, the, again, the restraints of flesh and space and time, he said, behold, I beheld Satan. Cast down from the heaven as lightning being cast down. Quick, fierce, ferocious. His war was a fleeting effort in the presence of God. And he was cast down to the earth. Raise your hand against God, thou fool. He's cast down. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fight back when he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. Do you hear this, church? There's no place for them in heaven, right? So why do we make place for them in our heart? If there's no place for them in heaven, why do we make place for them in our heart? We say, brother, how do I do that? We'll see how we do that. We'll see how we do that. So he falls back down, but he's not stupid. We do not have an ignorant enemy. The hater of our souls is very smart. He's very strategic. He knows you arguably better than you know yourself. And he waits. Patiently, ever so patiently. He works with such minute degree detail that you don't even notice. 
because he gives you what you want, what you secretly desire out of your sinful flesh. He disguises it as godliness. Look what he does. This ancient serpent who's called devil and the Satan. Okay, there's no mixed understanding here. This is that same old serpent, that same Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. His angels were thrown down with him. Heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ, the Messiah, have come. For the accuser of our brothers, our brethren, family, male and female embodied in this, have been thrown down, who accuses them, how often? Day and night before God. Satan is more faithful to accuse us than we are to pray. You see this? Day and night, Satan accused us. No rest. No, no departing from that goal, that mission, to prove our unworthiness, to justify it. If we would have just a taste of that passion in our prayer life, what would God be doing right now? Crazy to think about that. And then he, but he's no longer there. He's no longer accusing. And, and they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death, even unto death. So as Satan is cast down and his angels, he wages that anger, that enmity against the, the chosen of Israel who gave birth to the Messiah, he wages it against the people that are chosen of God, the church, and yet because they don't love what he can take from them, they persevere. Touch us with disease? Like Job, we will stand and glorify God. Or sit with postures and scratch ourselves, but we will not bring accusation to God. Allow sin to come into our lives to tempt us. We may stumble, but we will not fall because we confess our faults, knowing he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not a license to sin. It's not what this is saying, but it's we, we, we are fruitful for God because we are his children, not in order to become his children. This isn't legalism. This is freedom, gospel, grace, power, transformation happening. Satan cannot stop because we are already declared God's children. We're simply growing into that declaration through the power of the Spirit. Power of the Spirit. And you're going deeper. Under the second headline, the question of how does God control evil? There are four subpoints. I want to encourage you, if you ever wonder about that, read those. Because I know I'm going to get questions and emails. The first thing I'm going to ask you, did you read those passages of Scripture? Get a journal out, write down your thoughts, write down your questions, and then pursue them. And I'll help you pursue the answers to those, but read these passages. Go through it throughout the week. Rejoice, O heavens. The dragon saw he had been thrown down the earth, and he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child, pursuing the, the nation of Israel. But the woman who had given birth uh, was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly from the servant into the wilderness. And the place where she has been nourished for a time and times and a half a time. So suddenly, right here, this woman who, who represents the nation of Israel doesn't become the center of this serpent's attack. But what, what happens? What happens? The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to help the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. And then this dragon becomes furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of what? Her offspring, her offspring. In Romans chapter 11, Paul goes into great detail to explain how Gentiles are grafted into the inheritance promised to Abraham as the family of God. We are now part of that offspring. And we, as recipients of that title, of that parenthood, of that family reception and declaration of God, also become inheritors of this enmity that Satan has. And we become the target of his efforts. Because God's seal is upon us. And so he continues. This flood that comes out of the serpent's mouth. We have to remember that Satan is what? He's a deceiver. He's counterfeit. He's, he's the alternative. With the promise of all of the real. But he's the alternative. How many of you, like me, grew up in, in, in kind of economic hardship type times. And you had desired things. That, that were name brand, and you were so excited, and you open it up, and you realize it's knockoff. And you put on a, a good smile, because you don't want people to feel bad, because they got you, uh, instead of Optimus Prime, you got Charger Leader or something, and it, it, the arm fell off, and instead of a truck, it's, it's some kind of a, I don't know, something, I don't even remember what it was. Um, but I remember looking at that, and I'm thinking, I'm not taking this to school to show my friends. 
And uh, no, I gave my kids, I, I gave my, my Christmas presents up to some family in need. I didn't get anything. Or, or wanting Nike shoes and you get Spalding type stuff. You, you remember that? That's, that's where I was at. And, and, and living with that, it was... <laughs> But the, here's, here's the reality of what's happening here, and I say that jokingly because the title of the sermon is Israel and the Beasts. Try to play off Beauty and the Beast. You see that? Yeah? <laughs> but Satan is a deceiver, and what he's going to do is counterfeit, counterfeit what God is doing for the world, for the world. And he's going to be so good at what he's doing that I would argue that you and I are struggling with his deception right now. If it were not for the grace of God, right? And uh, so he continues. This dragon becomes furious, and he and he unleashes unleashes his fury. I want to go to um, Luke, and I'm going to read something. Uh, uh, actually, no, I'm going to skip that. We don't need to do that. So you're going deeper. I'm going to go to Matthew 24, and I, I just want to listen to what Jesus says about this time, about this work. Jesus said, "So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place." Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. We remember seeing this woman given wings, fled, right? And so let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house. Let not the one who is in the field turn back to take back his cloak. Remember Lot's wife. When God said flee, she was so attached. She had to turn. What happened? She was consumed by the judgment. Where is our affections? Where our love is? Where our heart is? There is our... Don't go back for that stuff. Alas, for the women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infant in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, nor will ever be. Nor will ever be. Interesting. Um, I want to do a sermon on that later on. But And if those days had not been cut short, listen to what he's saying here. If those days would not be cut short, no human being would be saved. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Why does God promise us that we'll have our days cut short? What is going to happen? Look what he continues to say. For false Christs, or uh, uh, it, verse 23, Then if anyone asks and says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, do you see what it says there? Or if you haven't turned, listen. For false Christ, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. We said to remember signs and wonders, right? When we read that. Because that's what the Holy Spirit is doing to confirm the power of the gospel. Now, we're told that it can be counterfeited. It can be a counterfeit representation. Similar to what the Egyptians, the magicians did before Pharaoh. Pharaoh, don't worry about Moses and his God. Look, we can do the same thing. Look, the staff became a serpent. We can do it too. Well, the, the water turning to blood, it's not blood. It's just red from the, from the Sinai. There's an explosion over there. It can all be explained. These counterfeit signs and wonders will be so convincing that it says if it was possible, it would deceive the very elect, the very people of God. But if it wasn't for God's word being true, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit instructing us through God's word, we would be deceived. The best of our ability cannot escape the deception that Satan counterfeits into this world. If that doesn't spur us to be hungry for God's word, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. And he says, so if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, don't go out there. Save yourself the ticket. And he says, look, he's in the inner room. Don't go in there. Hey, there's a van that's selling ice cream for free. Go get some. Don't go in the van. Right, folks? It's the same idea with people that say there's a Jesus here or a Messiah there. We know how he's going to return. So don't be deceived. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. As Satan fell from lightning as heaven, the lightning will represent the swiftness of Jesus' return and the climatic a reception of his inheritance. Wherever the corpse is, there will the vultures gather. So ideally, ideally, where the deception is, those who feast off deceptions will be brought. We, as the children of God, should not be going after those fake signs, those wonders, those confidence. If it doesn't align with God's word, it's not from God. Do we hear that? If it doesn't align with God's word, it doesn't matter what dream you have, what vision you receive, what word you hear spoken, it doesn't matter what you feel that the Spirit may be saying to you. If it disagrees with the clear expression of Scripture, challenge it. 
challenge it. Because what happens when you resist the devil? He flees. He flees. Truth. Deception cannot stand in the light of truth. Measure it up to Scripture. But if we don't know Scripture, if we're not going to the Bible, if we're just tuning in David Jeremiah, or we're watching Paul, or, uh, Jeffries in Texas, or Joel Olstein, or any other, other televangelist that I get emails about that are contrary to things that we're teaching or preaching, listen, folks, if you can't open your Bible and see it without jumping through hoops of fire backwards on a full moon on the third hour, there might be a problem with that teaching. Measure it up. Measure it up. I'm not saying that they're false teachers. Even things that I say, measure it up to Scripture. Don't take my word to the bank. I'm leading you to see Scripture. I'm walking alongside. If I'm wrong, I can be wrong. Know the Bible. Know the Spirit. And you'll be led in truth. That's his job, not mine. His job, to lead you in truth. And so he continues in Revelation chapter 13. Still making it read. The first beast... So this dragon stands on the sea, and he calls out of the sea, and if it hasn't gotten weird yet, from a woman giving birth to a child in space and a great red dragon coming to consume, if the war that happens in heaven, if it hasn't spiked your weird odometer yet, it's about to, because look what happens here. A beast rises out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, and ten diadems given delegated authority on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. Blasphemous against who? God, the Creator. Blasphemous words. Blasphemous words. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like a bear's, and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Jesus was challenged that he was able to cast out demons. Why? Because he was given authority from Satan. And so Satan has authority over his demonic realm to deceive. The Pharisees were challenging Jesus as being a worker of Satan, deceiving the crowd. That's what is happening right here. Satan is giving authority and power to this physical being that comes from the sea. And he continues to say, And one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. And its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed this beast. And they worshipped the dragon. Do we see this? They worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Peace I give you, said Jesus, not as the world gives it. Folks, this kind of peace, and this is what's challenging and hard for us, and why Christianity and preached in faithfulness becomes viewed as a hate message. I was listening to the school shooting that happened in Texas. And, and the, one of the students was sharing how it was just horrific that she had experienced that. Like she wasn't prepared to experience that. And, and it's tragic moments like that, that that cause us to yearn for a, a peace that removes the sense of fear. And I feel that as a parent. My children are going to public school next year. And that could be any one of our schools. We have teachers here. That could happen in any one of their classrooms. This could touch our lives at any moment in time. And there's this, this sense of, of fear that drives us to give whatever is necessary in order to receive peace. But the problem is that there is no peace that will truly satisfy outside of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we legislate. It doesn't matter how strongly we enforce it. It doesn't matter if we give bigger guns to someone else to protect. This peace, this this control, this authority is going to be vicious. Vicious upon humanity. They worship the dragon. They worship the beast. Why? Because no one could resist him. Who can resist him? You can't complain about him. This is worse than the censorship that's happening right now in our country. You say a bad thing and boom, it's gone. No, this is, this is worse than that. You cannot decree anything against this beast. Because retribution is swift. What is this going to look like? The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Now it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. And where does God dwell? In believers. In believers. Look what it says here. Blaspheming the name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Those who dwell in heaven. Heaven. 
I want to unpack that in a little bit. But he was allowed. He was allowed. Verse 7. And this is what I wanted to skip over. This is what is hard about this whole passage. And I wrestled with 101 ways, read tons all of my life uh, that I've had a theological mind. I have read commentary on this. But listen to what he says. This, this beast was allowed to make war on the saints. And what does it say? To conquer them. To conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been found written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, the Lamb who is slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain by the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance of the faith of the saints. Praying to God and hearing him say, I'm not going to deliver you. You need to suffer. And I need you to know. <clears throat> Satan can take away family. He can touch our wealth. He can reach into the core of who we are and destroy our hopes and our dreams. But the thing he can't take is what is ours eternally. He can't touch that. And for the believers here in this context, they're exhorted to let go of all the things that Satan can take. Let them have it. Even if it means your life. Do you love me? Am I enough? Does this sound familiar to the letter Jesus wrote to churches? Am I enough? I struggle to say that right now. What if I had to watch my wife get persecuted? Is Jesus enough? These people... In verse 19, or verse 10, if they're taken captive, they go. As Jesus was led to be slaughtered, that's the same spirit of surrender to the will of God. I will be a martyr. I will go. Now, there's going to be a lot of preaching to the truth and testifying that's going to happen that we'll see later on in this backstory. But the reality is, in this time, God encourages the saints to be faithful, to suffer, and to die under this beast. Where is your faith right now? At the beginning I talked about investing and maturing our faith. Folks, this is not a fairy tale. The Bible is not a joke. And the spiritual warfare that's happening is very, very real. In fact, I would argue it's more real than what you're looking at right now. There is a behind the scenes happening, even in this moment. Even in this moment. I promise you, when you walk out of here, from what you'll hear on the radio, what you'll watch on TV, what you'll read in a book, from what you'll do, there will be the whispers in your ear. <sighs> Damien, who does he think he is? Preaching a scare message like that. Don't worry about that. Don't read those scriptures. Just go home. What is your routine on Sunday? Go and do it. Have fun. Have lunch with friends. Relax. Take a nap. Have a drink. Go to bed. Guess what? Monday morning will happen. Routine. It's safe. It's comfortable. Don't worry about those things. Besides, as you start to drift to sleep and surrender, you can't even tell if it's your own thoughts or not. Besides, who wants to follow a guy like that? Don't worry about that. God wants you to have your best life now. Don't worry about that. That's not love. Why would God want you to suffer? And then before you close your eyes in that final slumber, you think you hear, I will be a better guy for you. That's how deceptive our enemy is, even to what we're hearing and receiving right now. I promise you, you'll experience that this week. How do I know? I experienced it all last night. I didn't sleep last night over this message. I had a horrific dream Wednesday over this message. I didn't sleep. I pray, I pray pray that my faith would stand. Lord, increase my faith. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> the rapture is an idea that has weight in Scripture, that it will happen before this. There's an idea that there's a mid-tribulational rapture that happens at what we looked at last week that has weight in Scripture. And then there's a reality that believers in the church will go through the tribulation that has its weight in Scripture. Where do I stand? I'll share at the end of the book. But my job as a pastor is not to prepare you for what I think. 
Is there a possibility that we could experience suffering like that? If you say no, you don't know the world you live in. You can turn on a dime. I would rather err on the side of seeing you strengthened in faith than set up a false confidence which becomes a false expectation on God and have you find yourself in a place to where you're questioning whether God loves you or not. Folks, God loves you more than this pastor could labor to express. And he says, to captivity he goes, the sword must be slain. What is his word to us? What is his word to us? If anyone has an ear, let him hear. The second beast, we're going to close on this. The second beast is just a, uh, a groupie. <laughs> if, in case you haven't figured it out, Satan loves to be worshipped, right? And every time God does something, because God isn't just standing on the sidelines, right? All that we read in Revelation is happening during this time. It's happening during this time. And so while he's working his magic counterfeits, while he's handing off his spaldings with a fake sewed-on Nike um, emblem, this, this another beast rises out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. Like a lamb. Do you see this? Like a lamb. And he spoke like a dragon. Who do we know speaks like a dragon? Very deceptive. Splitting blasphemy. And it's exercised all authority of the first beast in its presence. And it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Something's going to happen and make it look like he died and came back to life. Sound familiar? There's nothing new under the sun. Sounds familiar because it's, it's counterfeit. And he's, he's not only, not only, and how do we know it's counterfeit? Because look what he has to do to get people convinced of his superiority. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. In front of people, by the signs that it, it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives the whole earth, those who what, do not have the seal of God upon them. It, it, it deceives the whole earth, telling them to do what? Make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the beast to be slain, to be slain. You see the roads coming to a fine fork to where a decision has to be made. It's one thing to proclaim a faith, but it's another thing to say, no, my knee will not bow. He says it causes both small and great, rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. God has his seal. We have our own. So that no one can buy or sell unless he has this mark. That is the name of the beast, the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. This number is 666. Again, just counterfeit, counterfeit, counterfeit. The idea is, while it seems silly to us with knockoff ideas, this counterfeit is going to be so deceptive that even believers will know that it's false. But the cost is what fights our faith. The cost. The cost of family suffering? To be in this time, not have the mark and not be able to put food on the table, to not be able to go and have health care, to watch a child with a common disease that could be cured with a simple vaccine sit there and suffer and die because there's not a mark. To see the, the diversity that's going to happen, it's like in Egypt, the difference between night and day. But that reality is going to have its conquering presence over humanity. It's going to be the dominant power expressing itself over the whole world. Cost is what challenges the faith. And this is where I want to close. As our, as our worship team comes forward, and I know you're thinking, this is a crazy message. And how are, you, how, are, how are we going to close a message like this on a note that inspires us to walk closer to God? The idea of an image. All of what's happening in Revelation is shadowed here presently within our lives right now. We have idols in our own lives that we struggle with. There are lies and deceptions. I mean, let's be honest. We have sins that we entertain in our lives. We confess them. We repent of them for a season, but then we struggle with them again. We don't declare war on them. A few months back, I had us all sign a declaration of war against our personal sin. 
Where are you at in that process? And how is the struggle going? Where are the scars of battle? And I'm not saying this again, that we earn God's love. I'm saying that we pick up sword and we fight our sin and we fight these spiritual battles with spiritual weapons because God has given us his armor with a purpose. Not to earn his love, but because we have received his love, he knows what we are up against. And the spirit that works to transform us is being pushed back against by the deceiver of our souls. Satan himself. Satan is real. This dragon is real. These words are real. Mm -hmm. And his presence and work in this world is very, very real. If we are sealed with God's spirit, we are part of his family. We need to live soberly. This world, all that it has to offer, it is a blessing to us, but it's not a promise to us. Our family, cherish them, hold them. They might not be here tomorrow. Our health that we have today is a doctor visit away from being turned upside down. Let go of anything that stops us from saying that, yes, Jesus, you're enough. To be in God's word, go through these scriptures this week. Really unpack this. Invest in maturing your faith. What do you watch? Ask yourself, is this going to help my faith grow? Oh, pastor, it's just entertainment. I just need to sit back and unwind. It will help your faith grow. Your enemy's not sitting back and unwinding. What you're about to read, is it going to help your faith grow? The friends that you're around... The people that you, I'm not talking to people you are missionally a part of. I'm not saying that you live in a bubble and only surround yourself with Christian stuff. That's just, it's even more dead sometimes than some of the things that are in the world. But the idea is, the people that you allow to speak truth in your life, do you see Jesus central in your life? The words that you allow to lead you closer to God, are they truly coming from God? Where are, where's your faith in knowing the Bible? I challenge this at the beginning of this book that it's hard to go deeper when we're not in the Bible, right? And seeing some of these scriptures are new for us. And I don't want it to be new for us. I want us to know God through his word so that when deception comes, we can say that's false and watch it flee. That's the authority God gives us, but it's ours to take or to walk away from. And I want to challenge you to take it. That's what one step closer to Jesus looks like today, and it looks like for your week. Take a step closer. Go through this going deeper. Unpack it in your small groups and engage God in prayer. Pray for your loved ones. Pray for the world around you. Jesus is still the only answer, the only truth, the only way, the only life. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, God, thank you so much. Father, a message like this has taken its toll on my heart, and but Father, it's your word. And preaching expositorily forces us to face your word, Father. Face it, face to face. Father, and, and sometimes it feels like I'm just standing in, in your presence, Lord, and it's like fire that's just burning me. I have no strength to stand. I want to pull back. It hurts. Father, in the things of the lust of the eyes, the, the lust, of, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, Father, the things that I think are, I've conquered are still holding on to me, Father, and it pulls me down. And Father, give me the strength to let go. May Jesus become increasingly all that I ever need, Father. May I have the strength to let go in order to receive from you so that I can stand not in my own, but in Jesus Christ. As you see your son in my life, Father, may I walk as your son. May my heart beat to the rhythm that yours does. May I see this world and may I understand the backstory, the way that you see it, Father, and grieve over the effects that it has on humanity. While Satan wages his warfare, Father, your heart grieves over the fact that it has come to this. But Father, increase our faith. So that no matter the cost, Jesus will always be enough. I plead this in Jesus' name, Mr. Church. Amen. Amen.